Okay, so welcome back. Now, the first video, we spoke of iconic representations like maps, uh, which tend to tidy up things. That is, erase information that is deemed not important or irrelevant. Uh, it is in this sense that icons tend to imply erasure somewhere. Somewhere stuff is left out to increase legibility. This erasure can be backed by institutions with an interest in using icons such as maps for political ends, for example, or colonial ends, for example. Now we're going to look at iconization, but just remember, in the back of our minds, we're always thinking about erasure happening somewhere. But first, we're going to talk about fractal recursivity. Big words, right? Let's take on recursivity first, the word by itself, and break that down. So this word comes from recursion, or recur, or maybe to reoccur. Although I, I kind of like the word reactivates. So this is some conceptual schema that is reactivated at a smaller scale. So think about uh, those US maps, right? That have the whole country and north being right side up. Now this right side upness reactivates itself when we zoom in to state maps, right? So this is a downward recursion, smaller scale. The recursion or reactivation can also happen upward to larger scales. So remember, think of the Earth from space. Now that has a right side up. It reactivates itself again when we think of our solar system having a right side up. So all of these are upward recursions. A schema that is reactivated. A conceptual schema that is reactivated. Now the north on maps will also be applied to uh, for for example, the state maps, but also our phone maps. Even the way we, we individually navigate or drive on the road, we use these cardinal directions, right? Um, so all of these can be seen as recursions down to an even smaller scale. This is all a state or an ongoing process of recursivity. Now, erase that image from your head. We're not talking about maps. I'm going to give you, a, a, give you something else to think about. I want you to imagine a piece of broccoli. Yes, the vegetable that you eat. Big piece of broccoli, like, like this big. So you see a large head of broccoli. It looks like a single piece of broccoli. But when you zoom in, um, you get identical smaller little broccolis that make up the big broccoli. Now, both are broccoli, obviously. The reality is the smaller ones are broccoli, the large one is broccoli. Think of these as recursions, smaller and bigger scales. Now, what about the word fractal? So this is a math inspired word. So let's think of it in math terms um, or what sounds like math terms, right? Um, we can think of fractal uh, sounding like the word fraction, or maybe fracture, or a split, a fracture into two opposing parts, a dichotomy. Now this is an ideological schema that then becomes reactivated, recursively, recursively reactivated. That is, this dichotomy is applied to some other aspect of life or scale or social practice. So on page on pages 61 through 64, there is a discussion about this ever-looming east-west dichotomy. They are, there's many aspects that go into this particular uh, dichotomy, M many oppositions that we can map onto this dichotomy. Stuff like um, the west being civilized, the east being barbaric. Or another major one, uh, that we tend to use is the West representing order while the East represents disorder. So at a zoomed out scale, a global scale, right? The West includes 
Europe and North American countries, sometimes South American countries. And the East, in general, is Asia and usually Africa as well. Now, when we zoom in to Europe, Europe itself gets opposed to Asia, for example, or Africa. So this opposition at a global scale is projected onto a smaller scale. But let's zoom in even more, just to Europe. So we're coming into Europe. The East-West dichotomy again gets reapplied. So Spain is seen as more European or more Western than, for example, Ukraine, which falls under the Near East countries. As Irving and Gal observed, this opposition was also reactivated within the Balkans themselves. So one side was seen as European, and the other side was seen as more uh, Balkany, or the Balkans of the Balkans, right? Now, when we think about order versus disorder, this particular schema, West versus East, Order appears to imply, order, the, order in the West, right? Order appears to imply that everyone in Europe has totally got their shit together. Everyone understands each other, um, implying that everyone is monolingual. It also implies that everyone understands the same language, probably English. This is defined in opposition to the East, where it's imagined that there is this absolute disorder. Everyone's speaking different languages. Everyone has different allegiances because language is so connected to nation. It's chaos and it's disorder. Now let's look back at the idea of the West and Europe. If you've ever driven through Europe, you know languages change in practically every country. Countries sometimes are no further than five driving hours away from each other. You can pass countries within a few hours. And a lot of times you go into an area with a different language. Um, but in order to conceptualize the West as ordered, we don't think of all that. All of that is severely backgrounded or erased from the idea of Europe. That is erasure. If there is an erasure that perhaps iconization is happening, right? Meaning the European, the individual person, becomes an icon of order. So it doesn't matter that there's tons of languages uh, in Europe itself. Because that doesn't fit into the schema of order, the conceptual schema. It doesn't fit in there. So what do we do with it? We erase it, we ignore it. On the other side, the East. The East is being conceptualized as disorder. So too many languages means too many allegiances. This is projected onto individual people and their languages, meaning multilingualism uh, means disorder. The Eastern persona, the, the icon that comes into our head of the, of the person that stands for the Eastern figure, that person has too many allegiances, speaks too many languages. All these languages are mixed up with ideas of nationhood and citizenship. So these people can't be trusted because they have no allegiance to, any, to anybody, in other words. So the, the Eastern person is iconized and begins to represent a barbaric, uncivilized savage. And on top of that, everything potentially fits into this schema, from the architecture of buildings to the way neighborhoods are ordered or arranged disorderly, to public life and the government as being thought of as disorderly, down to the down to every single individual as being mentally disordered with too many allegiances so we see this east-west dichotomy 
reactivated on a global scale all the way down to the mental state of an individual. Now, one final thing, and this is really important. Remember I said that all three processes happen simultaneously, and many times they presuppose each other in different degrees. Now notice that each side of this dichotomy to exist, there already had to be a great deal of iconization, which means there was already a great deal of erasure on each side. So the West underwent uh, iconization and erasure, and the East underwent iconization and erasure. Both sides of this process, both sides of the dichotomy, interact with one another. Um, they interact at different scales. So we can zoom all the way in and see an interaction at the smaller scale with a bigger scale. Now, none of these semiotic processes, these three semiotic processes, happen totally autonomously. The iconization over here presupposes different levels of iconization over there, and vice versa. It's a complicated mess. It's a complicated pile of shit. And what is important to remember is that this is not a neat, uniform process. So many things are happening uh, within this process at the same time. It's not a linear process. Each aspect does not happen in a neat order. It's instead sometimes unpredictable, and many times it's only sensible when we step out of our own particular point of view. So remember, we, we get so used to seeing our maps right side up that it becomes nearly impossible to imagine it any other way. However, we always have to keep in mind that iconization relies on erasure. And erasures are recursively applied here and there, which implies an iconization over here at a different level, which was already an icon of a different fractal opposition, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we can use these tools uh, to figure out the conceptual semiotic schemas that often underwrite dominant ideologies or emergent ideologies. Okay, so you might not have understood everything in this chapter uh, exactly the way I felt the first time that I read it. I've read this particular chapter probably at least eight times, maybe. And I expect to continue reading this uh, because the concepts are so important to linguistic anthropology. With that said, hopefully this was helpful. I did my best to translate this into everyday language. Although I might have said the word shit too many times, I don't know if that's part of your everyday language. Um, you know, whatever. So, I am Mike. I will see you very soon.